Welcome to The Point. I'm your host, Jane Huger. We've got another great episode for you guys today. Alan Grayson, former congressman from Florida, has got a very strong point on military spending, one that I agree with wholeheartedly, uh, but we will get to that in a little bit. And we've also got a mystery 1% person who's going to come in and make a point about how the 99% should get off his ass. So that should be, that's interesting. And then Sir Richard Branson has a tweet that we're going to discuss. We've got some awesome panelists here. Ben Mankiewicz, the host of Turner Classic Movies, of course, is also all over the TYT network. Uh, we've got Brian Unger here, who hosts How the States Got Their Shapes on History Channel. You are also on It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. You're on NPR. You're on almost every show on television. That is correct. All right. Mm -hmm. And Shira Lazar is the host of What's Trending, a program that I've been on several times, and yes. it's a lovely program. I appreciate it. All right. Right, great, let's get started. So Alan Grayson's up first. Let's him uh, have him make the first point. I'm former Congressman Alan Grayson, and let me get to the point. The point is this. We're spending too much on the military. And by doing so, we're destroying our own economy, and it's been going on that way for quite a while. Let me give you some facts. We spend almost as much on our military as the rest of the world combined. We spent more on our military last year as a percentage of our GNP than we've spent in any year since 1991. Honestly, unless we're being invaded from Mars, there is no possible way to justify that kind of military expenditure, and it is destroying our economy. As I pointed out in my bill, the War is Making You Poor Act. We could take the money that we spent last year, and we could give everybody their first $35,000 tax-free no income tax at all. And we still have enough money left over to reduce the deficit if we simply ended the funding of the wars, $157 billion last year alone. What would that do, $157 billion? Well, do the math. You could create 5 million jobs, paying $30,000 for each job, and reduce unemployment from 8.6% where it is now to 5% overnight, and cure the economy if we simply stopped subsidizing war. The answer to all of our problems, the answer to the economy, the answer to unemployment, the answer to a bad housing market, the answer to all the things that trouble us is peace. And that's why I'm proposing peace as part of our platform this year when I'm running for Congress. If you want to learn more, you can find out more at GraysonForCongress.com. But the point, the point is we need peace. All right, I have to confess that I agree 100% with that point, uh, but what we'll discuss here, I'm going to start with the Unger taker. Um, I'm glad that the former congressman brings up the Mars invasion <laughs> because it is an irrational fear of things like that that is the big psychological motivator at, in Congress and at the Pentagon to keep spending what we're spending because it is based not in anything tangible, it's based like the Cold War, like the Vietnam War, it's based in probabilities and fear. And uh, I don't know how to apply a rational argument to that kind of fear. So that's a great point. So for example, in Afghanistan, we've been there for over 10 years, it goes on and on. What are we going to do? We're going to save the country? We say, we admit, Al-Qaeda is not there anymore. We've crushed them. There's less than 50 Al-Qaeda there. We already killed bin Laden. We've killed almost everyone except Ayman al-Zawahiri, and he's not in Afghanistan. So it's irrational. But how do we get them out of it? And guys, is it just that it's the fear that they're trying to stoke and use the politics of that? Or is it also because the defense contractors make a ton of money from it? That's the thing. There's a whole business around this. I mean, we're spending over $600 billion just in 2010 alone. So, I mean, there was a report that came out that one of these guys, one of the contractors, I mean, a lot of money just goes to them. It's not even that it goes to what's going on on the ground. I mean, they're spending $10 million on their bar butt mitzvahs for their family. Um, so there is an issue here. I think the war that's happening is here in our own country. We need to be bringing money back here to spend it, to bring it back to education, to health care, because... This whole country is falling apart itself, and we have to stop trying to save the rest of the world when we're hurting here at home. Uh, thank you, Ron Paul. Now, Ben. <laughs> <laughs> I am Canadian. I am Canadian. The, the, the Canadian version of it. <laughs> <laughs> or Rhonda Paul, we'll call you. Uh, ben, look, $157 billion. God, what would we rather spend that money on? Just about anything else, right? I mean, to Shira's point about education, anything else. I mean, is there anybody in the country who's like, yeah, I'd love to waste another $157 billion in Afghanistan? Why is it always Mars? 
<laughs> yeah, why can't we go to Uranus? Yeah, there's like seven other planets. Maybe, you know what, nuclear yeah. weapons could be on Mars. Yeah. I don't it's want to talk true. about Ben's That's what, Well, obviously Saddam put him there. There's just a whole ton of other planets that could invade us. Maybe You're we right. need to be prepared for that. You're right. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. uh, That's a good point. You, you know, should start spending more. You know what's funny? When they talk about discretionary spending and how, you know, there's always, that's where we can, you know, we're going to cut funding to public broadcasting because that's going to fix this problem. Uh, military spending is 20% of, of federal spending, right? Defense spending, 20%. The, the discretion, Medicare and Medicaid are like 23% and Social Security, 20 discretionary spending total, adding everything up is only 19%. I mean, everything else that we think is important that we spend money on, we spend more on the defense budget. Yeah, that's amazing. It's mm -hmm. larger than the rest of the discretionary everything, spending everything combined. Yeah. Yep. And then look here, let me give you more figures because Alan Grayson mentioned in 20, uh, that, uh, that our spending is more than anybody else mm -hmm. uh, and it's by a long shot, right? So for example, in the US we spend $687 billion. China is second at $114 billion. So we're way outspending them, and then you've got 61 billion for France, 57 billion from the UK. Poor Russia's down to 53 billion. We're spending well over 10 times what Russia is spending. Uh, who are we going to take on the world? I mean, but at the same time, you look at it and go, maybe. Well, I mean, know, we're in Iraq, Afghanistan, Libya. To, remember when military strategists and politicians used to theorize, or it wasn't even theory. They would they would suggest that we need to fight two wars. We need the ability to fight two right. wars at one time anywhere in the world. And that always seemed like something that was fantasy. Like when would we ever really be in a situation where we were fighting right. two wars in two different places at one time? Well, we have seen in the last two years that we're actually capable of doing that. But at the same time, we're so good at it now. We have so many personnel, so much machinery to do that. We actually insulate the population from how, what that feels like. Like, I don't even feel that this country is in fighting two wars so at one time. From and that the, cost yeah. of the money and the human life, all that expenditure, we're sort of anesthetized from it. And that's a very crafty thing that the Pentagon has been able to do. So two things about that. Uh, I read somewhere that uh, only 1% of the country has served in any of these wars, Iraq, Afghanistan, et cetera. Now, back in the days, World War II, everybody they're, goes. They're the real 1%. Yeah, unfortunately, they are, but they they, much and are. They, the, that one percent fights for the wars that the other one percent creates. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's the Shiro's point, right? The defense contractor with a ten million dollar bar mitzvah, you know, because he's got so much money, he doesn't know what to do with it. Because, and then there's the the, the F thirty five. They spent sixty six billion dollars on that plane. It doesn't work. The pilots pass out. And for lack of oxygen, right? I feel like we're behind in everything. I mean, we're behind in the American dream, and yet we continue this as if, like, this will make us number one. I will think, it? I think Brian <laughs> really. Number, number one in how much money we're <laughs> shoveling over to Lockheed Martin. By the way, in those uh, seven crashes, two pilots dead because they can't get a $66 billion plane to work. It's, and that's what it is, mm -hmm. and they pay off all the politicians. What the, what's interesting is the idea that it's acceptable to be fighting two wars that also will think, well, we're only fighting one at some point. We'll be like, oh, that's fine. We can always fight one. So I think that's a great point that we've sort of built that into the culture. The other issue is that $157 billion that Alan Grayson uh, uh, was discussing when he made the point. Um, <laughs> is that was the, clear. Uh, is that, uh, like... Where is that money going to go? Is that money, at some, these wars are ending. They are winding down. We're done with Iraq, sort of, and we're leading toward being done with Afghanistan. Do we really believe that we will get to the point where we stop those wars, maybe there won't be another one right away, and that we're just going to return that $157 billion to that sort of general fund? That's, yeah. of course not. No way. They don't, they're not giving it up. They will not give it up. Right. And then, you know, those wars, of course, get funded from a different batch of money than the Defense Department. They're like, no, 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 no. This is for defense and, and this a, is for offense, and I guess. that's a hideous thing that George yeah. W. Bush and Dick Cheney did. And, of course, the Obama administration has just moved right in because that's an incredibly convenient, uh, uh, w uh, sort of b uh, cra uh, uh, convenient, crazy bookkeeping that works for them. You, you left off at a really good point, which is... Let's say these, these wars are tapering right. down and, and winding down, and we do have more money, Maybe the, and that we do have this interest in like saving some money in the military. What would be nice is some progressive leadership that basically said, we're not going to basically just take that money and then pour it into butter, because it's the guns and butter argument that's been around forever. Mm -hmm. 
um, but would actually figure out a way to take that money that's unused and figure out a way to use it that doesn't just feed into the conservative criticism that basically liberals and or progressives are sitting around just waiting to get their hands on all that military money mm -hmm. so they can spend more on education, can spend more on health care, can spend more. There are many things to spend money on, but, but we, there's no. We would also balance the budget. How about that? But how about just balancing the budget for one, one would yeah. be a great. Yes, we're there's something else thing. because it's interesting, you know, when this fight over the this nonsensical, inexplicable fight that conservatives have embraced about the, the Keystone XL pipeline. Um, like, what if we took that 150, this is an idea, took that $157 billion and as, to, to, toward what Alan Grayson said, and we hired people to build crap and fix the highways and expand the rail system and really built it into the infrastructure. Republicans will have the same initial reaction that they have, that we're having at this point, that they're like, oh, look at liberals, they can't wait to spend it. Yet at the same, that's their claim on the argument for the Keystone XL pipeline is that no, it'll create jobs. But since we know that's not what they really want, because they'd never let us spend that money on infrastructure, that Keystone pipeline, oddly enough, is because they want to give it to the oil companies. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and whenever, mm -hmm. and this will be my last point on this, look, whenever you go to spend money uh, on Americans, the middle class, et cetera, they go, well, how are you going to pay for it, right? Mm -hmm. But when you go to spend money on war or, or taxes for the rich, they never pay for it. They never bother with, hey, should we, we should balance the budget, et cetera. But I want to leave on a note from a Republican president who I think was 100% right. That's the last Republican president to balance the budget, Dwight Eisenhower. He said, watch out for the military industrial complex, because mm -hmm. once, and, and everybody just leaves it at that, but you have to remember why he said that. He said, once we've created these companies whose job is to make money for more, they will want more war. Yeah. No one has ever been more right about that, and that's exactly why we're in two and a half wars and, and increasing We'll always every find day. another reason. We're back on the point. Well, we've got a mystery one percenter who's uh, sent in a video. He seems very animated about this. Let's watch. Hello there, 99 percent. Here's a special holiday message from us on the top in the one percent. You know, one in seven Americans now lives in poverty. And if that doesn't convince you retail humans that we at the top need another tax cut, then I just give up. The holidays were a time for giving thanks, so I'd like to thank the Tea Party for fighting so hard that we got to keep our tax cut. Of course, we don't really need that extra 3%, and really, your grandkids are paying for it, so I guess I should thank them. But we're the job creators, and we create so many jobs with our job-creating tax cuts that maybe someday we'll create some jobs that aren't actually in Asia. Over the past 30 years, our wages have gone up 375%, while you in the middle class have only seen your wages rise 40%. And this proves an important fact that Occupy Wall Street is made up of dirty, lazy hippies who just want a handout. So is Acorn. Remember, rich people pay Fox people to make middle class people blame the poor people. So now that we've outsourced your jobs overseas and had our taxes cut by those politicians we bought and our corporations subsidized by your tax dollars, we're going to have our media tell you to go out shopping for the holidays and spend money that will never circulate back into your local economies at our megastore businesses to save that economy we wrecked. Okay? Remember, if you fight for the bottom 99%, you're just committing class warfare. If you fight for us, it's pro-growth. Now go buy things to celebrate the birthday of that guy who renounced buying things. <laughs> Ta, keep watching Fox. <laughs> As you might have guessed, that's not an actual one percenter. That is uh, comedian John Fugel saying, who, who actually, by the way, has the number one uh, comedy album on iTunes. Uh, so that means he's making a lot of money. Well, that's true. So maybe he's in the top one percent because, uh, because of his album, Sexy Liberal. So uh, the funny thing is, though, uh, I had a debate on the current show on, on the Young Turks uh, with Peter Schiff, who is that guy. He, he's a one percenter. He's got sixty-four million dollars. Mm -hmm. Came on the show and he's like, "What? We pay too much taxes. We need to have the poor pay more taxes." We've never paid more in taxes. Yeah, said. which is just simply not true. What's the rationale behind that. Yeah. So yeah, it doesn't make sense. I mean, look, the rationale behind it is. We got this thing figured out. Who cares what the 99% think? Who cares Occupy Wall Street? Look, I, they've got Congress totally in their back pocket. They've got uh, the media th through Fox that John is talking about there, putting out that message of if you try to fight back, you're doing class warfare. Meanwhile, Warren Buffett says, he says, look, there's been class warfare going on for a long time. It's just that my class is winning, and fairly easily. Yeah, I don't understand. I, you know, we've talked about this a lot. I don't understand why uh, uh, liberals 
ever run from the term class warfare. Clearly, conservatives think that it is, oh, we'll just say you're doing class warfare and you'll retreat. Yeah, yeah, we're engaged in class warfare. Mm -hmm. Let's embrace the term. That's right. That's mm -hmm. okay. That seems tough. I guess it's not a tough enough word. I mean, it's too tough. Yeah, uh, first of all, here's who's not going to say he's doing class warfare, Barack Obama. I got it. Right. But, none but of I it. love what you're saying. Can you imagine if the president gets up and he's like, yeah, uh, here's what's <laughs> happening. Class warfare, we're coming for you. Yeah, okay, right. that would be awesome. He would win easily. You should start a petition about that on WhiteHouse.gov. Yeah, but I'm curious. I mean, I don't started. want to get too sidetracked, but I'm curious why Republicans think that's such an awful term for Americans to hear. Yeah, because they think, oh, you know what? Uh, it, it seems like because it makes it seem as if the poor and the middle class have all the power, mm -hmm. and they're conducting warfare on the poor victims, who the the one percent. But who thinks that? No one. Well, hey, Peter Schiff. Has there been some focus? Group testing on the word class. The I don't words. know. Do you I, think? I, I, I think there probably was. I'm going to guess now. My new friend Frank Luntz would say that it's not a good word. My hunch is they they're using. It seems to me they're using it less and less. There's it, a lot of negativity around it when you hear warfare. But I, like, I, I, oh my I'm, God. I'm with you. I'm with you, Ben. I, I actually don't know if it resonates. Yeah, I don't badly I with with the. It, 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 Class warfare feels like a good populist phrase right. that yeah. seems just. Yeah. You know, and, know. And the thing is, this conversation would never happen in Washington. And part of the reason for it, I think, is because the Democrats live in the same bubble as the Republicans. Somebody wrote about that today. They said, hey, listen, you know, uh, all their friends are probably in the top 1%, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so when you say class warfare, they take it personally. Not just the Republicans, the Democrats too, saying, whoa, wait a minute now, you know, I, my buddy is a banker, I'm in the top 1%, so that's why I don't think that there's any way that they're going to go in that direction. But look, there's a hundred different ways to tackle it, and, and, and I, if they care to do something, I mean, I love the way you're framing it, but, you know, there's a million ways to frame it, and you know, you mentioned Frank Luntz. And Ben was on a cruise with Frank Luntz, which is kind of interesting and questionable. Yeah, right. he was, he's a, you know, as you might imagine, he was an interesting guy to, yeah. to talk to totally. He's very, very, very He's sipping guy. margaritas. Yeah, he was into it. He was, just, a, he was, just, me, he was just me, Frank Luntz, I mean, and Wink Martindale. He has a giant party in Los Angeles every mm -hmm. year, right, and invites yeah. people from both sides to yeah. come yeah. out uh, uh, and, and go... Yeah, on absolutely. And we he's a, we can learn from Frank Luntz. No, no, he's a very smart guy, and and it, and he gave a speech to the uh, Republican Governors Association very recently, where he said, "Hey, you know what? We're losing this battle, right? Yeah. So it's interesting that you brought that up." He's like, "Don't even say capitalism anymore." because capitalism is now beginning to be seen as a dirty word. Mm -hmm. We've got to switch it up, make it like put free in there, free markets, et cetera, because we're beginning to lose ground to socialism in the United States. He said, I'm scared to death of Occupy Wall Street. That was in an internal presentation to the Republican governors. So the Republicans actually have gotten the memo that you're talking about. Ben, unfortunately, the Democrats haven't, right? <laughs> well, mm -hmm. and, so, and when you look at the income inequality, it's just through the roof. you know. Uh, Top 1% control 40% of the nation's wealth, right? And so, uh, you know, to, uh, one of the hedge fund managers was complaining the other day, John Polson, the guy who made a killing off of shorting uh, the home mortgage market. He's like, oh, we have to pay 40% of the taxes. Yeah, that's because you have 40% of the money. Yeah, right, and it's a... You know, they like, feel like it is a survival of the fittest. For a lot of people who I talk to are in the 1%. They're like, why should I pay for their problems and their mistakes? That's how they look at it. Right. I just love seeing Russell Simmons and Kanye West like heading to all the walk, Occupy Wall Streets. That's always ironic to me when I see them because, I mean, I appreciate the support, but then you know they're still living the 1% lifestyle. It's but, not but, like I, but nobody in the Occupy movement, we're not, nobody's begrudging anybody a mansion. Nobody's begrudging yeah. anybody ten, fifteen million dollars a year, a hundred million dollars a year. We just want you to pay, and then we want to do something about like the hard numbers of the forty-six million people in this country are poor. Yeah. Now that's more people than Indonesia, which has almost as many people as we do. But from a percentage basis, it's act we're actually right around the same numbers. I mean, we have well, actually I got that exactly backwards. We have a slightly uh, lower percentage, but we have more poor people in this country than they do in Indonesia, which is absurd. Twenty-seven percent of, of of black people in this country live below the poverty line. Twenty-six percent of Hispanic people. Like there's a yeah. I let go class warfare. That's absurd. That's better than one in four black people in this country. Yeah. And two, two points on what Shira said. You know, Russell Simmons, 
uh, when uh, they were going to clear out uh, uh, Zuccotti Park mm -hmm. and uh, and Bloomberg said, oh, it's costing the uh, government a lot of money uh, to keep this thing going. Well, someone's like, yeah, it's cool. I'll pay for it. Okay, which is amazing, That's which is very great, cool. yeah. right? And then uh, second of all, you know, the one percent talk about survival of the fittest, but wait a minute, you guys didn't survive. <laughs> you crashed, and we had to bail you out. They didn't That's survive at all, right? I mean, so yeah. they got no leg to stand on. Barack Obama has not campaigned yet. He really hasn't started. He's been, right. and, and everybody's screaming at him to lead and lead and lead and lead. But he's basically, I'll get into the race when it's time for me to get into the race. And I think why, why. Frank Luntz is scared and why other people are scared is that his vernacular of we need a level playing field is way more resonant and way more effective with the American people. And when he starts campaigning on that message and starts hammering these guys, they should be very afraid. Why hasn't he started then? Because it's too early to run. Yeah, they'll still start after Iowa. You know? But I mean, that idea that he'll campaign and, uh, and, tar and, and start talking about that as opposed to the other argument, which is we need a pipeline. Yeah, no, cause, uh, yeah, yeah, cause nobody, I, I think right, we're nobody, gonna win. Nobody yeah. begrudges anyone a mansion or no, a fancy no, car or a second home. About or a boat, what they do want, and this is what everybody wants, is a level playing field, mm -hmm. a fair shot, and justice. Yeah. Justice for those who abuse the system. Nobody needs a yeah. boat. You right. know, but my, my final point. <laughs> I can't afford the luxury tax myself. <laughs> right, and, and by the way, yeah, boats are a pain in the ass. There's, there's no <laughs> Even the smallest yeah. boat oh, is a pain in the ass. Canoe, really? Yeah. Oh, I mean, it's on. canoe, you think I'm gonna make it in a canoe? I'm gonna tip over. <laughs> anyway. And then you gotta buck a canoe? It's like, a, it's crazy. I don't even know what that means. <laughs> okay, uh, no, but look, last thing is, uh, Sheer made a good point. Why, yes, hasn't been why hasn't Obama been doing this for the last three years? Why is he waiting for the campaign to be like, all right, we need a level playing field. Yeah. You know what, we could have used you when you were president. Mm -hmm. How about that, right? Mm -hmm. And by the way, you still are. Mm -hmm. Let's hope that, that, that he continue or he starts to act that way. All right, welcome back to The Point. Now, we found a really great tweet by Richard Branson. It's really interesting. Sir Richard Branson, um, he says, there are more black people in prison today for taking drugs than there were slaves in the U.S. when slavery was abolished, which is amazing. And that's literally true. Sure. What, what conclusions can we begin to draw from that? Well, I was just really impressed that he spoke out like that. As someone who's, you know, um, such a prominent leader and in the mainstream space, for him to make such a, what could be perceived as a controversial statement, um, but it all comes down to um, he was involved in with Portugal and um, their, you know, anti-drug movement, and they ch they changed it from the Department of Justice to the Department um, of Health, and they said this is a health issue. It's not a justice issue. Putting people behind the bars isn't going to solve the problem and it's something that we need to look at ourselves here the issue we have here at home I mean the fact that there's more cocaine use here in the US than marijuana in Portugal I mean there's crazy stats that came out of this case study yeah and look one of the things that sure is referring to is that the drug use in Portugal has gone down fairly dramatically since they uh, basically stop prosecuting people who are taking drugs. 13 to 15 year olds fell from 14.1 percent to 10.6. 16 to 18 year olds 27.6 to 21.6. Meanwhile, it's not like, hey, well, they're in Europe, all the you know drug use is going down. No, yeah. the rest of Europe drug use is actually going up. Property crimes way down too, because right. what 50 to 80 percent in Branson's piece, he said, of all property crime is committed by drug users. Mm -hmm. So you eliminate the drug use. What also went up in that period of time was people seeking treatment. So all of a sudden you decriminalize it, and people who are addicted think it's okay to come forward and seek help because they're not going to be criminalized. Heroin use down, everything down. Rates of HIV infection through intravenous drug use down. I mean, nothing but great societal benefits. Yeah. Yeah, I, you know, there's two aspects of this. One is a, a war on drugs, which I think is an invisible failure. The other is how often African Americans are getting locked up for the war on drugs. 12% of the country, uh, but they make up 40.2% of all inmates in the system. Wow. Now, of course, look, our population has risen since the end of the Civil War, so we also have more blacks in the country, so that's why you All have of a sudden, slavery doesn't seem like such a big deal. I think everybody <laughs> should just pipe down about it. <laughs> <laughs> right, and uh, so, you know, and obviously that's not what Branson's getting at, but he's uh, getting at, you know, but visualizing that, I mean, right away, exactly, you get that there's the an issue, there's a problem. We spend right now $50 billion on the war on drugs here in the States. 
Mm-hmm. I mean, that in itself. See, we're spending on the military, on the war on drugs. There's a war on everything right now. Where could we be putting that money? So what it winds up being is the, uh, a war on a lot of us. So whether it's African Americans getting locked up in this country, and by the way, it's selective prosecution. Totally. Um, it, you know, the amount of times that blacks are prosecuted for crimes that whites are not prosecuted for, especially in the drug arena, is a crime. It's or outrageous. Lindsay Lohan. Right. How many times has she been prosecuted? I, yeah, right. And how many minutes has she spent in jail? And then uh, in Mexico, when nearly 40,000 people have been killed in the war on drugs. Mm. And who, who's winning? Nobody's winning. I mean, Brian, is there anybody who thinks if we just wait a couple more years, we're going to win the war on drugs? Um, I don't think anyone thinks that. I mean, this argument makes me want to stab myself. I mean, because we've been arguing this same issue since we were kids in school, in debate class. And it's a circular argument that never, no one ever exerts any leadership on. And, uh, you know, look, this is one of those issues, I believe, that states need to decide for themselves how they want to prosecute criminals who use drugs or whether they are criminals at all. How they want to deal with their state prison systems. California is broke. We spend $9 billion a year in California housing people. And yeah, a good percentage of those are drug offenders. But when we rely on the federal government to dictate to us how we're going to spend money on fighting this war on drugs, it really takes away from states, basically, and to determine what they want to do on this issue. You know what's really interesting today is that everybody's taking different turns being Ron Paul, because that's exactly what Ron Paul says on the war on drugs. (laughs) You stole my act. (laughs) But but he's right again. I mean, look, I would go much further. So let me throw that out there. I mean, not only would I uh, legalize marijuana and I do it across the nation? Yeah. I'd legalize every single drug, okay? Because you're never going to win that fight. It's prohibition. The minute you make it prohibition, you create gangs, you make it worse. Have the government sell it for cheap, and what happens in the Netherlands, in Portugal, is that drug use does not go up, it goes down. Because yeah, it's not you know cool what, to Jay? go into a government here, building and be like, okay, give me my heroin. Here's the futility of relying on Portuguese statistics. It's like relying, <laughs> it's like taking, it's like the whole, the, you, go, you <laughs> what is it, <laughs> like, is that, you, you, that was funny in and of itself. Like, you know like we should borrow the social security system from Costa Rica. I mean, it just doesn't have, you it will never resonate, convince yeah. Americans to borrow anything from any country other than something from England. Or but, Canada. Because that's where we get, forget Canada. That's, a, that's even worse than the yeah, Portugal. Yeah, you guys gave us mad I mean, cow disease. Oh, yeah. 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 do it in Portugal. Is it, which is like, <laughs> so I think the national argument has no place anymore because we haven't solved the problem for decades. This war on drugs keeps going and going and going. I, I'm t- I know it, it, it does sound Ron Paulish. You know, you know, but now it, in L.A., I mean, things have changed. There were places uh, popping up across the city, you know, green spots, green stores, and now they're cracking down on that. And so it's interesting to see every state now, you know, be changing how they approach. But I'll tell you what, since we've been doing medical marijuana in California, everybody has lost their minds. Uh, it turns out Reagan was right. Everybody's on drugs, and like Everyone California's was falling apart. But California then it was before what you're clinics were legal, though. <laughs> What's that? I said everyone was already nuts in California before <laughs> right. pot, pot, pot was legal. And the thing looked, is, though, my biggest problem with this whole argument is we keep asking people to fix this issue that are not drug addicts, because only a drug addict knows what it's like to be hooked on heroin. If you've known anyone who recovered from heroin, they'll tell you methadone was worse than is worse than heroin. It's like we have people advising a system that have no connection to the system, and sometimes and that's mm-hmm. that's why we're not getting anywhere on it. Right. And look again. Sometimes this comes back to the money. Their methadone is legal in that the states even force some of the heroin addicts to take methadone, and that's partly because somebody gets paid on methadone. You know, it's the illegal stuff. The drug guys get paid on that. Nobody makes a Politicians don't make a profit on that. Whatever they make a profit on, they push. But you know what? Now private prisons are all over the country. Oh, yeah. And they got to fill up those prisons. Mm-hmm. And so a great right. way to do that is the war on drugs. You know what the war on drugs remind me of is the, uh, the Cuban embargo. Like, it's as fruitless as this. Like, we've been doing this for 51 years. It's not about to start working. Mm-hmm. We're not about to have Cuba go... You know what? You're right. You got us in a bind. We're the only country who behaves this way. And, and for the war on drugs, the, obviously the embargo has no effect at all. And then none. And we're getting a whole new generation of people thinking differently. And in the war on drugs, there's also like, you know, um, you watch any story that any television show does that uh, current TV did, the Vanguard series did, on the Ciudad Juarez in Mexico. And 
like that's also gonna there are like thirty thousand dead people from this mm. nonsense. That if that's it's gonna have an effect there too. Forget how it's gonna improve our lives. It's gonna make I know again nobody in America gives a crap about what happens to anybody in Mexico, but it's gonna have an effect there too if we ever change this. You know I love that analogy. I mean who sits there in in reality and says if we just give the Cuban embargo one more year, <laughs> one more year, I think we got them on the ropes. Yeah. Okay, <laughs> we're ready for the knockout punch. It's the same with the war it on is. drugs. Is there a single person in the country who thinks if we just go one one more year, we're gonna win the war on drugs. It's so asinine. You know what we're gonna do? Richard, I got this tweet for you. The Young Turks thanks you for your strong stance against the pointless and costly drug war. You've been retweeted on the point. <laughs> <laughs> All right, now I wanna make my final point of the week, and it's actually on Ron Paul, a guy that we've been discussing throughout the show. Uh, I think he's getting hosed. And it's not because I'm in favor of Ron Paul. There are some things that I agree with him on, whether it's legalizing drug, ending the wars, our civil liberties. Yes, I agree with him on those. But he wants to get rid of Social Security. He wants to get rid of the income tax. He wants to get rid of the Department of Education. I totally disagree with him on all, all of that. And so I'm very concerned about those issues that Ron Paul has. But before, everybody was saying Ron Paul is irrelevant because he's in second or third and he's just a fringe character and he's never gonna make it out, he's never gonna win. Now he's number one in Iowa, number two in New Hampshire. And what do they turn around and say? Oh, winning Iowa doesn't matter. In fact, if Ron Paul wins Iowa, all the pundits are saying it makes Iowa irrelevant. Wait a minute, I thought Iowa was supposed to be the most relevant thing in the world. In fact, Terry Brand said, the governor of Iowa, said if Ron Paul wins in Iowa, in his home state, then who wins doesn't matter. What you gotta look at is who comes in second or third. Wait a minute, when he was second or third, you said it was irrelevant that he was second or third. No, this is absolutely outrageous. Bill O'Reilly and Fox News Channel despise him as well. O'Reilly goes out there and says, I've disqualified him uh, because of his views on Iran. Then he turns around in another program and agrees with Ron Paul's views on Iran, which is that it would be crazy, it would start World War III if we went into Iran. No, the establishment hates this guy. The reason they hate him is because he would actually change the system. Now I think some of it would be for the better and some of it would be for the worse, but he would bring you real change. And that's why the establishment doesn't like him. All right, that's been our show today. I want to thank everybody. Brian Unger, uh, how the state's got their shape. Everybody check out the show. I don't know a single person who doesn't love that show. Aw, thanks, Jake. And uh, What's Trending for Shira Lazar. I yes. also love that show. What's I've been Trending on it. Dot com, check yeah. it out. And, uh, you know, I haven't been on how the states are, got their shape. So, oh, okay, so that's why I'm leaning a little more towards what's thanks. trending. <laughs> ben, I've only done like a couple of thousand shows with you, although I've never been on Turner Classic Movies. And you never will be. No, oh, well. I can try to get you on Swamp People. Okay. Oh, swamp People. I'll try to get you on Swamp People. Uh, that's where I belong. Okay. And of course, I want to thank Congressman Alan Grayson as well, uh, who uh, shared a point with us, and John Fugel saying, whose uh, sexy liberal album is number Rock one on iTunes. Let's go, sell it. Thanks to Richard Branson for joining us on The Point. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. And he's, of course, the CEO of Virgin Airlines. He's an entrepreneur, a billionaire. All right, <laughs> we'll see you next week on The Point. Thanks, guys.